Hello, this is Aaron Davern, creator of the 5-Minute Math Videos. We are looking at the entire 6th grade star test for 2023. I'm using a modified version of the statewide item analysis report. You can follow along by grabbing the QR code off the screen or the link in the description. Each item will be looked at one at a time. You can use the bookmarks embedded in the video or jump to any timestamps you see here on the screen. For number one, we are looking at credit reports. This is TIG 6.14e in reporting category four. It's a pretty easy question to start off with. We don't have any calculation here. We are simply looking at which information is not included in a credit report. Now, none of this information is on the reference materials. So we need to know this going in, but we need to know that a credit report is something that lenders will use to see how likely we are to repay uh, a loan. So what would be useful in order to figure out our trustworthiness to repay a loan or to repay, you know, something we purchased on a credit card? Well, the number of late payments uh, would definitely help them know whether or not we're keeping up with our payments or where we're constantly late. The number of credit cards, it might make a difference whether I've got five cards or whether I've got 15 cards. High school grades, I don't think that much has anything to do with money. That just has to do with how you did in high school. You can get a new you know, credit card when you're 45 years old, 55 years old. They really don't care what you did in high school. You've maybe went to college. If not, you've been out for 30 years, so it doesn't really matter. And then your previous employers, yes. Do you have previous employers? Have you worked in the past and have you made much money? So these three things are going to be helpful. It's this high school grades that's not going to be really helpful, especially if you think about what happens if an older person, even a grandmother, gets a credit card? They're not going to need the high school grades. So that is our answer C. Let's see how we did across the state of Texas. So this was tied for the third easiest. Not that surprising here. We had almost 70% of our students get it correct. And we see there wasn't really an answer other than this previous employers that might have tripped some of our students up. But even then, it was pretty evenly distributed. Some students might not have uh, really been thinking about uh, the fact that who you worked for made much of a difference, but it matters uh, how many jobs you've had and the steadiness of your job and, you know, the various factors there that indicate how much money you make, how much money you have made in the past, how long you have stayed employed. All of that helps a lender decide whether or not to lend you money, how credit worthy you are. For number two, we are converting units. This is a readiness standard, TIG 6.4H, in reporting category three. So we have a jar containing 75 grams of spice. We need to know what is the amount of spice in milligrams. We're just making a change from grams to milligrams. We can actually look at our reference materials here. We actually have this metric right here, right? So look at this weight and mass. And there we go, right there at the bottom right, one gram equals 1,000 milligrams. So if one gram equals 1,000 milligrams, take a look. I've got 75 grams, so I've got 75 times this. So 75,000. It's right there in front of you. And so our answer there is going to be A. Let's see how we did across the state of Texas. So this is it. Number two was the easiest problem on the entire test. Look at this. Almost 80% of our students got it correct. Now, how do we get some of these incorrect answers? Well, remember the correct calculation was 75 times 1,000. So it's going to be a variation of either multiplying or dividing by the wrong thing, right? So B here would be using that 1,000, but instead dividing it by 1,000. Right, but that wasn't even the most chosen incorrect answer of getting the thousand, right? Milla means thousand. It's also on the reference materials. If we do C, we're going to divide by 100. And the most chosen incorrect answer here was D, and that's another multiplication, but look, they didn't add enough zeros. 75 times 100. So this is a pretty simple problem. Unit conversion is pretty straightforward, and so... Uh, we just need to give our students a little bit of practice on this and then move on. For number three, we are looking at equivalent fractions, decimals, and percents. This is TEKS 6.4G, a read in the standard in reporting category one. 
we have a salesperson here and we are selling eight out of the last 25 customers so eight let's make that a fraction eight out of the last 25 that set it up for us we need it turn that into an equivalent percentage okay so we don't go straight from a decimal uh, from a fraction to a percent we go from a fraction and we need a decimal then we can go to a percent so there's two different ways to make this into uh, a decimal right one way is you can always divide up no matter where you are what you're doing if you have a fraction you can always divide up turn it into a decimal so let's do that first there's a slightly quicker way but let's just go ahead and do it this way first so 25 goes into 80 how many times mm -hmm, three times so that's going to be 75 and we're just going to add another zero okay so there we go 32 so this is going to equal 0 0.32. Now to turn this into a percent, you either multiply by 100 or you move the decimal over twice to the right. So it's 32%, right? So we've got that right there. We see variations of that all over the place. Now, another way that's a little bit quicker might be to look at this and say, you know what, if I get my denominator into tens right because that's the tenths place hundreds because that's the hundredths place or thousands because that's the thousands place then you can put it straight onto place value chart and if you multiply top and bottom by four with to make an equivalent fraction you get 32 out of 100 and that's 32 hundredths and so sometimes that just skips a step you still have to move the decimal over twice but if you can get the denominator to change into a ten, hundred, or thousand, you could put it into the tenths, hundredths, or thousands. So our answer here is B. Let's see how we did across the state of Texas. So this was the ninth easiest problem here. We see that three out of five, 60% got it correct. And we're kind of evenly distributed across the incorrect answer choices. Now you can see here that if we had a decimal of 3.2. If you only move the decimal over once or multiply by 10, you get this 3.2. So they, they did the work. These students just uh, made a decimal error. How do we get the 3.125? Well, if you see this 8 25th, and you remember you're supposed to divide something, right? Sometimes what you might do is you might divide the numerator into the denominator, which is not what we're supposed to do. But if we do this, right, what we're going to get here is we're going to get 3.125 and so that's going to get us right exactly uh, what we have for c and d and so what we would get here is we get the 3.125 and maybe they just slap a percentage sign there maybe they move the decimal over one right but these students made the mistake of instead of dividing up they divided down they divided the numerator into the denominator and your first clue should have been if you can divide if you can divide a fraction and you don't have a zero in the ones place and it's a proper fraction you did something wrong whenever you're dividing a fraction it's a proper fraction where the numerator is smaller than denominator your first answer should always be zero if it's not you did something wrong you should immediately go into the decimal if it's less than one so we just need to give our students a little bit of extra practice of converting from a decimal uh, to a percent if the error was here right with just the percentage sign being uh, being in the correct spot but the decimal being in the wrong spot or moving from a fraction to a decimal of percent and using multiple strategies you know the strategy of trying to get your denominator into 10, 100, or 1,000 is also a good extra way to practice students so they can verify whether dividing up is the right choice for them or not. For number four, we are looking at multiplication and division. This is a rating as standard TIG 6.3e in reporting category two. So we have the cost of one pound of cherries is 350. Right, and so we need one and a half pounds of cherries. There's a few different ways we can do this, right? We could just go straight decimal and we can say, all right, so I've got 350 per pound. I've got one and a half pounds. If I can change this one and a half into a decimal, right? So let's change, keep the one, one half, right? One of our benchmark fractions. 
0.5. I could just go 350 times 1.5. When we multiply decimals, we don't have to worry about lining up the decimals. We'll deal with the decimals at the end. So this is just straight multiplication. 25, and that's 15, that's 17. And then you just write a 350 underneath, multiplying by ones. So easy. It's a 0, that's a 5, that's a 12, 5. Now I've got three digits behind the decimal here. So I need one, two, three digits behind the decimal. That 0 kind of looks weird. So we'll drop it off. $5.25. Now that's just a straight multiplication by decimals. You could also, I just kind of do it like this, right? So let's kind of make like a strip diagram here, okay? So I've got one full pound, right? And that's going to be $3.50. Now I need a half a pound. I just need to know what is three fifty cut in half. Right, so I'm going to divide by two because that gets me half, and that's going to be bring the five down. Make sure you put the decimal up there, it's going to be seven, and then that's going to be five 175. Okay, so half of 350 is 175, and then just add those two, right? And look, it's exactly what I have right here 175 and 350. So it's going to give me the same thing, 525. Either way, our answer here is C. Let's see how we did across the state of Texas. So this was the 10th easiest problem uh, and on the test. And you see that we have a little bit less than three-fifths, or 60%, get it correct. Now what I find interesting here is, take a look at this 450, even this $5, right? How did we get one out of every four students almost get $4.50? Well, if you take your one and you're not really sure what to do, you can just add 350 in one, right? And you get your 450. Or if you want to be a little bit more challenging, you can take your 350, one and a half is 150, right? Or 1 1.5, and that's going to get you your five. And that's this right here and this right here. So students that chose A and B, right, that's 36% of our students didn't even realize this was a multiplication problem. That's why the first step would always be to draw uh, some type of representation. So you saw I drew the strip diagram, right, after I did the ca calculation to show you an alternate way. But it's always good to draw some type of representation, right, to show the one pound and the half pound because that's going to let you know, you know what, this is a multiplication. See, 1.5 times 350, or you could just, you know, break it apart and you could add it. This would also get you the same answer. But just taking this 350 and adding it to the 1, or taking the 350 and adding it to the 1 half, that's not going to be good enough. So our students need a little bit of extra practice of recognizing multiplication situations in these problems so they can set up the problem correctly. For number five, we are summarizing categorical data. This is TEKS 6.12D, a readiness standard in reporting category four. And this is going to be an inline choice. So it's two points, one for each of these that we fill in correctly. So let's take a look at our problem. So we've got the number of sports choices that students make, basketball, soccer, tennis, and volleyball, and the pair or pair of sports. So I'm looking down here first right? That represents the mode. All right, so the mode is a vocabulary term that we need to come into this problem with. It's not going to be on our reference materials at all. The mode is the most chosen, the most popular, the one that's got the greatest result. So we're simply looking for the biggest, you know, the biggest term, soccer. So our answer there is going to be soccer, but if we don't know what mode is, right, then obviously it's, we're just going to have to guess. So we need to come into this knowing that mode is the most chosen. That's pretty simple. The percentage of campers who chose basketball. All right, this is a little bit more difficult. So what we need is a fraction. Okay, so we're going to do basketball over total. Because if we can get it into a fraction, right, then we could turn that into a decimal. Then we can turn that into a percent. And that's what we're looking for, a fraction to decimal to percent. How many kids chose basketball? 
That's easy. That's 10. How many total are there? Well, let's add them up. These two make 20, 30, 40. Okay, so 10 out of 40, right? So that simplifies to 1 fourth. Now, hopefully, we know our benchmark fractions. 1 fourth is 1 quarter, 0 0.25. 25% move the decimal over twice. So that should be a benchmark fraction that we have memorized once we simplify it. So it's going to be 25%. That's how we get full credit. Let's see how we did across the state of Texas. So this was tough. This was the third most difficult question on the test. And I'm calculating that by looking at how many students got full credit, both points, only 20%, only one out of every five students got this correct with both answers. Now, we have 50% with partial credit. So if you put these two together, you're looking at 70%. That's not that bad. But we're looking for full credit for these kiddos. And if I were to guess, I'm thinking both of these are going to be difficult because mode is probably not something that we spend a lot of time on in sixth grade because we've been talking about mode for years. We spend a lot of time on median. We spend a lot of work on that, but mode is something that we are responsible for. It's in our state standards. We have to keep that fresh in our students' mind. And even this, the percentage of campers. We have to know that if we can take our basketball over our total, that that will get us a fraction, right? So that's implied. We have to know how to make that fraction and then do the calculation, turn it into a decimal, and then turn it into a percent. So I think both of these uh, provided a challenge for these kids. And I think if we were to see a distribution of which of these two items got incorrect, which we don't have, I think we'd see it split pretty evenly. So we need to give our students tons of practice on problems just like this, give them a data set, have them choose the mode, have them choose the percentage of campers that chose this or did not choose this sport. Um, have them do all kinds of things, just get used to seeing this and finding the mode and finding the percentage of the campers that chose just one of the sports. For number six, we are representing additive and multiplicative relationships. This is standard 6.6C in reporting category two, a readiness standard. Seems pretty simple. We have to find a relationship here that is multiplicative. And I know it's multiplicative because it's got this y equals three x. And when there is a number right next to a variable and there's no operation in between, we can always assume it is multiplication. So we need a multiplicative relationship here. And if we're going to multiply x by 3 every time to get a y, it's going to be pretty steep. That's what I'm thinking here. Like if we were to kind of graph it like that. And that's really what we're going to do is we're just going to look like, so this a right here, right? So if this is our x's and our y's, right? What we're saying here is we're going to multiply our x. We're going to multiply that by 3 to get to our y. So let's just say if our x is 0, because now I'm looking at my x-axis, then my y should be 0, because 3 times 0 is 0. Okay, that's, that's good. If my x is 3, well, then that should be, you know, 3 times 3, so that should be 9, and we get a problem. So... A is automatically out. So let's check B, right? Same thing, right? 3x equals y. So if my x is 0, how is my y supposed to be 3? If I multiply x by, you know, by 3, if x is 0, obviously the answer is going to be 0, 0. So that's wrong. So B is out of commission. So let's take a look here. I've got my x and my y, and 3x equals y. So if I've got, okay, I've already got the 0, 0. We've already seen that's good. Now I've got an x of 1, and so 3 times 1 is going to equal 3. So I should have y of 3, and I do. Look at that, x of 1, y of 3. That works. Now I've got an x of 2. So I need to triple that. That's going to equal 6. There we go. That looks good. So C looks good. Let's just double check. D, yeah, straight line's not going to work. How can you multiply this x by 3, right? So this is x equals 3. So that means 
the y should equal 3 times the 3, 9. I don't have any of those as 9. 9 would be up here off the chart. So it's not D either. Our answer here is C. Let's see how we did across the state of Texas. So this was tied for the 13th most difficult. Take a look at our answer distribution here, right? So we only had 38% get it correct here at C. But look at A, 29%. And D, if we were to scroll down, we can see it is at 23%, right? When you're seeing two different answer selections that are close to that 25% mark, and you see that if you kind of average these two right here, you would get about 25% average. That, to me, tells me we have a whole lot of guessing going on here. There were a lot of students that really didn't have any idea how to solve this because the answer distribution kind of tells us that. So what was so difficult about this? Well, we had the y equals 3x, so maybe there was an issue with do we know that 3x equals 3 times x, right? Recognizing that is a multiplicative relationship. Maybe the fact that there were no tables and it was straight to a graph. And you had to build your own x and y table for each of these graphs to test them. So either of those two really could have tripped our students up. I think our students at least did a good job of eliminating b because that didn't look right uh, having, you know, having that up there at the 0, 3 rather than at the origin. But other than that, it looks like our students really struggle with this. So this is one in which we need plenty of practice going straight from an equation to the graph and having the kids do the work of building their own you know, x and y tables. And they don't need to just be multiplicative, right? It can be y equals 2x, or it could be y equals x plus 2. And we need to see the difference between those even have them graph both on the exact same graph with different colors to see the difference between an additive and a multiplicative relationship. For number seven, we are interpreting numeric data. This is TEKS 6.13c, a readiness standard in reporting category four. So we have a dot plot here. And with a dot plot, right, you have to look at the key, but for most dot plots, uh, it is gonna be that each dot represents one person as we are here. That's standard, but always double check in case they uh, change that. And then we just need to interpret this to find one of these as the true response and three being incorrect, right? So a total of 10 people responded to the survey. Well, I see a range of 10, right? So that's a, a range. I don't know if it's a total. Each dot represents one person, so we need to count how many dots there are. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Nope, there are 18 people that responded. The range is simply 10. There were eight people who took two or few trips. Two or fewer. All right, so I'm going to draw a line right here. And I'm going to say that this is right less than or equal to two, because that's really what that means is two or fewer. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, that looks okay. So let's make sure C and D are incorrect. All the people who responded to the survey took at least one trip, at least one trip. So that means everyone is greater than or equal to one. Yeah, but what about those guys? There were three people that took zero trips. So that's not going to work. Half the people who responded to the survey took five or more trips. Okay, so our total was 18. So if I take my 18, cut it in half, right, that's going to be nine. So I need to find... Nine people on one side, nine people on the other side. Let me find where that halfway point is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so here's my nine. So that's half the people. Uh, and then this is the other half the people. And it said half the people took five or more trips. Now this line right here uh, is going to be took four or more trips. If we could change that to four, that would be correct. But no, only one, two, three, four, five, six. Only six out of 18. That's not half. Took five or more trips. All right, so our answer here is B. Let's see how we did across the state of Texas. So this was tied for the sixth easiest. You see we had 67%. That's two-thirds of our students get it correct. So good job to them. Good job to Texas. And it was interesting that at, you know, 17%, almost one-fifth of the students got this one incorrect. This one didn't require any type of calculation. 
right? Obviously, we have these students or these people right there that would make that incorrect. I was interested that D, I thought that might have tripped up our students a little bit more because you had to go in and find that halfway point right here between the three and the four. And I'm wondering if we had our correct answer down a little bit lower and this incorrect answer up a little bit higher, if a little bit more students might have been tripped up on that one. But I didn't get them because they were able to find B. So good job for us. We just need to continue to practice with dot plots. They're pretty straightforward. Uh, but when we are looking at the this type of interpretation, a lot of times we will see median, we will see mode, and those weren't asked on this particular problem. But we also need to make sure that they can continue to find the median mode and range. For number eight, we are solving proportionalities. This is a ready to standard in reporting category two, takes 6.5b. And this is going to be equation editor, so I just need to type in the answer. There's no A, B, C, or D to choose from. And so what do we have here? Out of 850 people in the art museum, 32% had an annual pass. Okay, so 32% of 850 had an annual pass. I need to find how many people did not have an annual pass. Okay, so I've got two different options here. One would be I can find how many people had an annual pass, right? So let's do that. That's 32%. So how do I find 32% of 850? There's a few different ways to do that. You can make a proportion, do cross multiplication. What I find easiest is just to transform this percent into a decimal, 0.32, and then 0.32 of, or times, 850. All right, so let's just find 0.32 or 32 hundredths. That represents 32%. So that's 0, that's 10, and that's 16, 17. And then that's going to be 0, 15, 24, 25. All right, so I've got 12, 7, 272. I've got two digits behind the decimal, so I need two digits behind the decimal. So there's my 272. That is not the answer. This is how many people had an annual pass. I need to find how many people did not have an annual pass. Well, how many people are there? There's 850. So... If 272 had an annual pass, that means the rest did not. I'm just going to subtract. So that's going to be 8, and that is going to be 7, 578. All right, I'll type that in in just a minute. That's one way to do it. If I wanted to do the subtraction on the front side, I could have done this. I could have said, well, let's see. Uh, if there's, you know, there's 100% of people, right? If 32% had an annual pass, that means if I subtract the two, right, that's going to get me how many did not have an annual pass. So that's going to be 68%. So 68% did not have an annual pass. So I need to find 68% of 850. So once again, let's turn that into a decimal. So it's going to be 850 times 0.68, 0. 40, 64, 68, 0, that's 0, that's 30, that's 48, 51, take a look at that, 578, two digits behind the decimal, the factors, two behind in the product, same thing, 578, so that is our answer, 578, so we'll type this in here, and we'll see how we did across the state of Texas. So this was it, the number one most difficult problem. Only 12% of our students got it correct. This, even though this is a new item type, it's only one point. You either get it right or you get it wrong. Only 12% of our students could have gotten that. There were so many steps in this, so many ways in which a student could have gotten this uh, incorrect. Right. So even if we recognize that 32%, right, of 850 means that I can take, you know, the 0 0.32 times the 850. Even if I got my 272, right, how many of our students probably entered 272? We don't know what they entered. 
So we don't have that on the state item analysis report. But I bet so many of our students entered in 272 because they simply did not read this word not. They didn't subtract, you know, from the 850 in order to get my 578. So that's probably one error right there. It's just not reading that not. Some of our students might not have even been sure of how to find the 32% of 850, even if they could have figured out how much was not the 32%. Right? Translating this 32% of 850 into a simple multiplication problem, even if they can put that into a multiplication problem. You know, you've got a 3 by 2 multiplication. There are just opportunities for basic calculation errors. So we have lots of opportunities as educators here. This exact problem, you know, give them out of so many people, they need to find a percentage of the total, percentage of the whole, have them find, you know, both the actual percentage and its complement or the percent that's not. That is going to help lots of practice and for them to recognize when they're looking for the percentage of and the percentage that's not and also have them practice solving it both different ways, right? In this way, we found the 32% of 850, and then we subtracted that from the 850 uh, to find the, the how much did not, or, right, you could subtract the 32% from 100%, and then just straight multiply the 68% of 850, and then that would also get you your 578. Have them see that both options work. For number nine, we are looking at area formulas. This is TEKS 6.8b, reporting category three. And they already tell us that, you know, the triangle, area of a triangle is one half base times height. And so we just need to find the model that best represents how to justify that. So this is a little bit different because we're not necessarily calculating, we're just recognizing. All right, so here's what they're wanting us to see here. Area of a triangle is one half base times height. If we go back to our reference materials, take a look. That's the very first equation we get. But look what's underneath that rectangle or par parallelogram is base times height. So the triangle is simply half of the rectangle or parallelogram, right? So this is what hopefully we're seeing here. You can take your rectangle. Right? And there's your base and there's your height area. Is it? base times height. If I cut it in half like this, diagonally, I get two triangles, right? That's one visualization of why the area of a triangle is half of base times height, because two triangles can make a rectangle, if they're this type of triangle. You know, you can't put two equilateral triangles like this together and make a triangle. It wouldn't work. But let's take a look at A. Right? So can I put two, these two triangles together and make some type of rectangle or, or parallelogram? No, this shows four smaller triangles, so A doesn't help me. Uh, if I look at B, right, what I'm getting here, this since this is equilateral triangle, this isn't even making smaller triangles. It's just showing that I could use any of these three sides as my base and any of these diagonals as my height, since they're all the exact same height. So B doesn't really help me either. Now C, take a look at this. If you take this triangle and you invert it, look what I have right here. That's a parallelogram. And what do we know about the area of a parallelogram or the area of rectangles when I have base times height? So yeah, this definitely shows that if you double this triangle here, you're going to get a parallelogram. So that works because these two triangles make one parallelogram or it's, you know, the one half base times height plus one half base times height, right? Just equals one whole base times height. And then D, they do double it like you're supposed to, right? There's two triangles, uh, but that doesn't make a parallelogram or a rectangle. So the answer here is going to be C, let's see how we did across the state of Texas. So this was the 16th easiest. It's right in the middle of a pack of a 36-question test here. And you see that we got a little bit less than half, get it correct. The one that I really think tripped us up here, obviously, is this A, right? So 
I think one thing that was a little bit confusing about this was we saw this full triangle turn into smaller triangles, right? And they even they even labeled it, right? Look at that, one half of height and one half of base. And if you think about it, that kind of makes a little bit of sense, right? Because we got half the height and half the base, and it makes that little tiny triangle inside. Um, but that doesn't actually help us because there's four triangles now, right? And so you're making it, you're making it smaller. And so these students probably just weren't really sure exactly what this was asking for. And so this is what we need to do for our students. We need to connect these two, right? We need to connect the area of a parallelogram or the area of a rectangle or a square for that matter, right? With the area of a triangle. We need to just consistently take a parallelogram or a rectangle, cut it in half and say, look guys, I just made two triangles. So that's why the area of a parallelogram or a rectangle is area equals base times height. And the area of a triangle is one half base times height because you can take a parallelogram and a rectangle and cut it in half and make two triangles. That's what they need to see because if they saw that, then this make a little bit more sense. So number 10, we are looking at benchmark fractions and percents. This is TEKS 6.4F, reporting category one. The problem itself is multi-select. So we need to find two correct answers here. Two point problem. So we just need to find what are these two values here? Well, first off, we should immediately recognize, but we can easily verify this is tenths, right? Because I've got from zero to one, right? So if I want to label these, this is going to be, you know, one tenth, two tenths, three tenths, four tenths. This looks like about halfway, right? Five tenths, six tenths, seven tenths, eight tenths, nine tenths, or ten tenths and one whole. Okay, so we're good there. So we label this as tenths. So I see a 0 0.2, so that's pretty simple right there. I don't see a 0 0.6. Okay, so if I don't see a 0 0.6, I need to think of how else could I represent this as 0 0.6 or 6 tenths. Well, 0 0.6, 6 tenths. So I don't see that as a fraction, but I should see that as a fraction and say, hmm, both even. My teacher tells me all the time, simplify, simplify, simplify. So I can reduce by twos. Look at that. I've got my three fifths. And so these two are my answers. And let's see how we did across the state of Texas. So this was the 18th easiest, right in the middle of a 36 question test. And you see that we had 45% of our students get, you know, the full credit, two points, and 43% get just one of the two points, right? So if you put these together, now we're looking really good, right? We're looking at 88% getting at least one point, but we want both points. And uh, we don't know which of these answer selections were chosen. All we know is the full credit, partial credit, no credit. I have a feeling this was probably one that our students were able to get, right? Because that's just straight on there. I think this is the one that we still need a little bit of work in. Right, when you see the six tenths, whether you write the six tenths like this, you could have done the whole thing in fractions, but that also could have worked. That's just not there. And so we need to continue to help our students look at any fraction, right? If we could turn that into a decimal and simplify, simplify, simplify. Because that simple thing that we needed to do might have stood in the way of some of these students getting full credit. For number 11, we are looking at integer operations. This is TEKS 6.3D, a reporting category two readiness standard. Now we just have a basic expression here, which means we are gonna need our order of operations. So uh, we're gonna look at our parentheses and our exponent. Now, one thing that I always wanna make sure that students recognize is that when we're looking at our multiplication and division, even though we write the multiple multiplication first, we write division second there, inverse operations. So you could do division first if you see it left to right. Same with addition and subtraction. Even though we write the addition first, their inverse operations are equal. So you could subtract before you add. 
So we see this parentheses here, but this parentheses really isn't doing anything. It's just separating the, the 35 minus and then the minus 110 or the negative 110. It would look weird if you wrote it like this. So that's why we have the parentheses just to kind of create a boundary, but it's not really doing anything. So that's not really a parentheses. There's no exponents. So we see multiplication and division is going to make a big difference, which one we do first. And like I said, they're inverse operations. So we need to go ahead and do this division first before we multiply. And that's always the trick is when we see a division before a multiplication. So let's do 110 divided by 5. It's going to end up being negative. So I'll just grab that negative at the end. So that's going to be 10. That's going to be 2. Okay. So that's 22. But remember, it's negative 110 divided by 5. So that's going to be negative 22. So let's rewrite this 35 minus, I'm still going to have that parentheses there because that negative 22 needs to look like that, times 2. So I took this negative 110 divided by 5, made that negative 22. Now I've got a subtraction, and i got a multiplication, so this comes next. So I just need to take my 22, double it to 44, it's still in negative because negative times a positive makes a negative. Now I can finally subtract this negative 44. When I subtract a negative, two negatives make a positive. So really, I'm just adding 35 and 44. That's going to be 79. So our answer here is C. Let's see how we did across the state of Texas. Now take a look at this. This was the fourth most difficult problem, only 22%. But look, this was the least chosen answer. And... Like I said a few problems ago, when you see four answer choices that are close to 25%, that means we're guessing. And across the state, we did not feel very comfortable with this problem. So even if students wanted to get started on this, let's see what happens if we multiply first. Because that's not what we're supposed to do. But let's say we multiply first, right? So that's going to be 5 times 2 is 10. So now I've got this 35 right, minus this negative 110, right, divided by 10. So now if I divide the negative 110 by 10, that's going to get me this 35 minus, and that's going to be, end up being negative 11, right? So I could get a 46 if I wanted to, right? Uh, if I wanted to get A, then, you know, maybe I subtracted, right? So maybe I didn't know what to do here. I did all of this correct. Uh, rather than this way here, I got this 35 minus this, and then we had the negative 44, remember? For the original way, the correct way. I didn't know what to do with the minusing the negative, so I just subtracted 35 minus 44, right? That equals negative 9. So maybe I got that one, right? Obviously, we, we just saw how to get that one. Uh, and then this D, right, is we're just adding, you know, this, this we're just going left to right, right? We're just adding the 35 uh, to negative 110, right? We're getting this negative uh, 75, and then we're dividing that by 5 to get the, you know, the negative 25. And then you know, or negative 15, and then we're multiplying that by 2 to get this negative 30. So there's a way, to, if you just go left to right, you can get this negative 30. But quite honestly, I think a lot of our students were struggling with this because the least chosen answer was the correct one, C. So we need lots of practice. What do you do when you've got, when you're minusing a negative? That's the step. That's one problem that our students are diff having difficulty with. And what do you do when you have to divide before you multiply? Or you could, you know, subtract before you add. Because we're so used to writing PEMDAS. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Some students think that you always have to multiply before you divide. And that is not the case. They're equal. Same with addition and subtraction. So we need to give our students plenty of opportunities to subtract a negative. See what happens there. Divide before they multiply. Subtract before they add. 
for number 12, we are looking at expressions and equations. This is TEKS 6.7b in reporting category 1, and this is the first time this TEKS has ever been tested on the STAR test. So this might have caught some of us off guard here. Let's take a look at what they're asking us to do. We need to simply figure out what is an equation. Well, if it's not an equation, what could it be? Well, if it's not an equation, it's going to be an expression. So that's what we need to figure out. What's the equation? The other three are going to be expressions. So let's write these out. We can see the difference between those. A number is less than or equal to negative 12 and 6 tenths. So a number, let's say x, is less than or equal to negative 12 and 6 tenths. All right, so that's uh, not an equation, that's not an expression, that's actually an inequality, because we don't have an equal sign, right? We have uh, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. So that's not an equation, we're literally looking for an equal sign. B, a number minus 10, so a number, let's say x again, a number minus 10 is... 37. That is, that's how we uh, represent equal. So that is definitely an equation. So that looks good. Let's see what the other ones look like. 7 times a number. Okay, so 7 times a number. That's just 7x minus 60. Okay, so that is an expression because it just represents a value or a quantity. There's no Equal sign, there's no greater than or less than sign. And then a number to the third power, so that would be x cubed, or x to the third power, also an expression, because right, that just represents a number, and a quality, or a value, but not any type of operation here that has an equal sign. So our equal sign here is going to be in B, and that's what we're looking for. Let's see how we did across the state of Texas. So this was the 17th most difficult, right in the middle of the pack of a 36-question test. You see, we only got 41% of our kids, 2 out of 5, actually get it right. I would say this kind of looks a little bit like guessing, because we see, you know, these two answer selections by 26%. But really, no one was interested in this last one. And so maybe it's just our lack of experience with exponents. Uh, we might not even know that to the third power really represents this. So this is definitely difficult for some of our students because it's uh, been previously untested. Even just recognizing this, a number is, what do we do with a number? I automatically know that I can represent a number with a variable. I just happen to choose x. But do students know that? Because we have all of this a number, a number, a number, and it might have include just confused them because they didn't know what that meant. And then, obviously, you know, we're looking for equals, but even finding that word is here is a little bit difficult. So we need to give our students some practice with this, taking some expressions, taking some equations, and having them, you know, take the, uh, just the expression or the equation and write it out in words, have them practice that, or obviously we can give them some word forms, some written out forms, and practice writing it out uh, like we did here. Number is less than or equal to negative 12 and 6 tenths. But just giving them an opportunity to go back and forth, first verbally, and then in written form, how do you go from this inequality, how do you say it out loud, to how do you write it down? Number 13, we are looking at ratios and rates. This is a read in standard, TEK 6.4b, reporting category 2. So we have 63 dogs at a show, We've got a ratio of large to small, we're looking to find how many dogs at the show were small. All right, so we've got different quantities here. We've got 63 dogs at the show, right? So that's going to be our total. And then I've got large to small. So I'm going to represent it like that. Large to small is 4 to 3. So I need to make sure I've labeled these correctly. 4 large to 3 small. So how can we set this up, right? Because if I set it up like this, 4 large to three small, right? I know how to set up this proportion here, but I need I need to match, right, the, the labels, and I don't see total in the label. But really, I'm just looking at small. So what if I did this? What if I said there are three small, 
And out of this initial ratio, what do I have? I've got seven. Because I just know that the other four happen to be large. If there's three small, there's going to be four. That's like a, a miniature version of this ratio here. And so now I'm looking at 63 total. And there we go. We know that when we set up these proportions, right, we need to have the same labels in the numerator and the denominator. And that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for how many total small dogs there are. All right, so this is an equivalent fraction, right? Because we've got this, uh, this ratio here that we could use. So how do we get from 7 to 63? Well, hopefully we see that as multiplication, right? 7 times 9 equals 63. So in order to make an equivalent fraction, we need to multiply both numerator and denominator by the same number. So 3 times 9, well, that's going to equal 27. So there's going to be 27 small dogs right out of the 63 total if we wanted to double check right there'd be if we did this for the four large right we'd multiply that by four and that'd be 36 right so if you add your 36 and your 27 you're going to get down to your 63 because that ratio of four large to three small maintains all the way through but i'm looking for not the 36 i'm looking for how many small dogs we have the answer here is d 27. Let's see how we did across the state of Texas. So, this was the 10th most difficult. Take a look. We only got 35% of our students getting it correct, and that wasn't even the highest. Look, we had a few more students actually choose B as an incorrect answer than we had D the correct answer. So, what is it about this 38%? We noticed in my explanation, it took me a little while to figure out the ratio that would work. So, what if our students aren't that comfortable with ratios or we don't really know how to set this up? Well, look at what we have here. Small dogs. I know the ratio of, of large to small is 4 to 3. So I know my 3 goes with my small dogs. And there are 63 dogs at the show. So what if I just did this? 63 divided by 3. Because I think I'm supposed to divide. Look. That gets me that 21. So there is a whole host of students here that really don't know how to set up these ratios, right? The 3 to 7, how to make it look like a proportion so that you've got the equivalent fractions and you can find how to multiply the numerator or denominator by something to get up to that 63. This just needs a lot of practice because once we get it into this form, right, a lot of students can complete it. The problem is getting it from this problem situation into a workable proportion. So what we need is practice. Just practice, 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 doing uh, the same time thing with different, just different numbers. You can even just use the same problem. I just change the, the proportion, obviously make sure they still work. Sometimes have them choose the large dog, sometimes have them choose the small dogs to look for. But just practice with the same one and then slowly expand to different types. That's how they that's how they grow their schema of understanding what to do when you get these problems in the future. For number 14, we are graphing on the coordinate plane. This is a readiness standard T6.11a in reporting category 3. Even though it's a new item top graphing, it's only one point. We either get it right or we get it wrong. So two things we need to know. Where's quadrant 3? And then we need to know horizontal distance. After that, we can figure out that two and a half units. All right, so what are we talking about here? Well, let's first label our quadrants. So hopefully we know this is quadrant one, quadrant two, quadrant three, quadrant four. If you're wondering how I knew that so quickly, right? think of just the letter C, starting from the top, how we write it, and it goes through the four quadrants in that same order. Top right, top left, bottom left, bottom right. Now, there's our point R, so it needs to be somewhere in this quadrant right here, and horizontal distance, right? Well, obviously it's going to have to go horizontally because it's next to, to the left of quadrant 4, right? But we need to go side to side, right? And the reason we need to know it is in quadrant 3 because if I go 2.5 up, right, I'm going to end up right there. If I go 2.5 uh, to the right, 
I could do that, but I'm still in quadrant four. So I need to end up in quadrant three. If I go two and a half down, I'm still in quadrant four. And if I go one, two, and then half right there, now I'm in quadrant three. So that's literally all I'm doing is I'm plotting this point here. It's going to end up being at uh, negative 0 0.5, negative 1. But the answer is literally just plotting it, and that's it. So let's see how we did across the state of Texas. So this was the fifth most difficult problem. Not even one out of every four students could get this correct. And I really think there were two things that made it a little bit difficult here. Is First off, if you don't know quadrant 3, then you're kind of out of luck and you're just guessing. You might be able to count horizontal, um, you might be able to use the horizontal distance, but you've got just as much chances going over here to the right as you do to the left, right? So quadrant three is really important to know where you needed to end up. And secondly, the fact that, you know, look at our scale factor, right? The, the scale factor is going by integers of one, right? So negative one, negative two, negative three, one, two, three. And so two and a half, it's not super intuitive to know that you can actually plot a point there. So I could see some students just not really sure and end up pointing one, you know, getting really close and getting it on a whole number rather than getting it where we need to on that half. So this just takes a little bit of practice. And you can do this with pencil and paper. Give them some grid paper and just have them plot points. Give them a starting point and say, I need you to go vertically three units and these to end up in you know, in quadrant one, or you need to go horizontally, you need to end up, you know, four units, and it needs to stay in quadrant four, something like that. You can just have them move around like that to get them comfortable with, you know, first off, which quadrant they need to end up with, and then secondly, how they uh, use half units and not just whole units when they're moving horizontally or vertically. For number 15, we are writing equations from tables. This is standard 6.6b in reporting category 2. So we have Gabrielle and her mother, and they were born on the same day of the same year because we're trying to figure out you know, the distance between their ages here. So we didn't want to mess with half a year older or a year and three months. So they're on the same day of the year, right? And we're trying to figure out which equation best represents these. Well, even if we didn't see the numbers, we should already know that this is going to be an additive relationship, uh, simply because of the context, right? Gabriella and her mother. So if your mom was 30 when you were born, she's always going to be 30 years older than you, right? That's an additive relationship. So let's start that and see if we can find an additive pattern. So how do we get from 3 to 30? Well, if we add, right, we're going to get up to 27. So add 27. What if we add 27 to 5? Does that get me to 32? Yes. If I add 27 to 9, does that get me to 36? Yes. And then that works. So, I mean, that's all we're doing, plus 27. Now, it's G plus 27 equals... M, right, I'm getting these letters from there. So they flipped it around. They did M equals G plus 27. But, you know, it's the same thing. So our answer here is B. Let's see how we did across the state of Texas. As you would expect, we did pretty well on this. Almost 70% of our students got this correct. It's just a basic additive relationship. Fourth easiest, tied for fourth easiest on the test. The only answer selection that kind of tripped us up is this D. It's very alluring to maybe think that the answer is D. Typically, it's not, even though we do actually have a none of these coming up as the correct answer later on in the test. Uh, but that's just kind of usually a, a pretty cheap way of getting out of doing the work, right? Do the work to, to first find your own, uh, and then ver only select none of these if you've verified that all three of these don't work. And even if you don't find any of these, Right, what we could have done without finding it on our own is we could have plugged some numbers in, right? We could have said M, right? 30 equals 10 times 3. See, A works as long as you just use the first pair. Then if you try the second one, 32 equals 
10 times 5, that's when it breaks down, right? But you could have plugged some numbers in. Do all those things before you select none of these. For number 16, we are looking at the order of operations and prime factorization. TIG 6.7a, a readiness standard in reporting category 1. So we just need to simplify this expression. So let's use our order of operations, right? And remember, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. We need to make sure that we are looking at it first in parentheses. But really, we're just looking to see if there's any operations in parentheses. There is, right? So we'll handle that first. Sometimes they use parentheses to kind of separate uh, you know, negatives from other negatives, or they use it just to represent multiplication, so we don't always have to use that. Uh, then exponents. And then when we get to multiply or divide, remember those are inverse operations. They are both equal, so you can actually divide first if you see that left to right. And then we get our add, subtract, same thing. Inverse operations, you can subtract first if you see that before addition moving left to right. So first, we need to take care of whatever's the parentheses. We pull this out and we treat that like it's its own expression. That's what the parentheses does, isolates it. Within that, we've got two things. We have, you know, the exponent and then we have the subtraction. So we do the order of operations within that parentheses. So we do exponent first. That is not four times two. That is four times four, right? Four squared. So that is going to be 16 minus 10. 16 minus 10 is 6. Okay, so all of this comes down to 6. So now we bring in the rest of it. 5 squared minus 6 times that 6 minus 3. Now, parentheses are done. Exponent. 5 times 5 is 25. This is not a 5 times 2. This is 5 times itself, 2 times. So that's 25. Let's just bring the rest of this down here. So now we're left with some subtractions, but we do have a multiplication right here. Take a look at this. 6 parentheses 6. That means 6 times 6. So we need to keep that 25. And that's going to end up being minus, and then 6 times 6 is 36. Now we're just left with two subtractions. Okay, so we can just do the first one. 25 minus 36. Now this is where it gets a little bit tricky here, right? So... If we take a larger number from a smaller number, that means we're moving beyond, right? So if we've got 25, it only takes me a jump of 25, taking me back to zero. I still need 11 more to get a total of 36, right? So I'm going to end up at negative 11. So that's negative 11 minus 3. And then if I'm going to take another jump, minus right, that's going to end up at negative 14. So all that work, we get to negative 14. Let's see how we did across the state of Texas. So this was hard for our students. Take a look at these answer distributions here. When you see this, and they're that close to 25%, obviously this one's a little bit lower, this one's a little bit above. That means we have a whole lot of guessing. There were students that probably gave this a good try, messed up somehow, came up with an answer that was not like any of these four, and then just simply guessed. We got a few students that obviously, you know, worked it out, but there's so many students that probably did not figure out how to do this. We do a lot of order of operations problems in sixth grade, but typically they are not this convoluted, right? We might do just this right here. We might do a parentheses and then an extra operation on the outside. And even what to do within the parentheses, knowing that A, that this is not four times two. I know that's that's not something that's necessarily new to sixth grade. We've been looking at exponents a little bit in fifth grade, but that's still kind of a fresh topic. And so, so many of our students, when they see this exponent, they think it's four times two. If I make that an eight rather than a 16, everything gets all messed up. Same with this, if I make this a 10, Rather than 25, everything gets messed up. So even if I can get out of this correctly, right, this 16 minus 10 is 6. The fact that when that comes back into this right here, and it becomes negative 6, parentheses 6, sometimes we don't know that those two numbers next to each other separated by the parentheses means multiplication. So that's another thing that we have to worry about. 
is that multiplication. So we've got the two different exponents. We've got the, this weird way of representing multiplication with two numbers separated simply by parentheses. And then we've got just the rest of order of operations. There's just a lot to work on. I would suggest if we're working on order of operations, as we can tell here, we need to increase the complexity. We need to have parentheses. We need to have division and multiplication. We need to have addition, subtraction. We need to use exponents more so they get comfortable with exponents and not just do simple ones like this. Because I think our students could do a simple one like this, but there were multiple levels that they had to work through. We just need to increase the complexity of the expressions that need to be simplified. For number 17, we are solving one variable equations and inequalities. This is TEKS 6.10a, a reporting category to writing the standard. So it's very simple. How do we solve this inequality? We need to know our properties um, of equality here. So what do we do here? Well, we've got a 9w. And we've got, you know, a less than and then a 108. So something we're starting really in sixth grade. And we will continue all the way through the rest of our mathematical career in middle school and high school is solving for a, a variable. So how do we get that w by itself? Because take a look at these four answer choices. They all have the w by itself. So that's what we're talking about. How do we isolate the variable? Well, we have to look at what operation is connecting that 9 to the w. Okay, So it's 9 times w. When you have a number next to a letter, that automatically implies multiplication. We think inverse operation. So what is the inverse or the opposite of 9? You divide by 9. So if I were to divide by 9, what is 9 divided by 9? 9 divided by 9 equals 1. So it's really just 1 times w, but 1 times anything is itself. So we just kind of drop the 1. We just say w. So how do we isolate that variable? Well, we divide by 9. But properties of equality say that we can't just do that to one side of the inequality. To keep it balanced, just like if this were an equation, right? We have to do the same thing to both sides. If you divide both sides by 9, it maintains the equality here. So we're just simply dividing 1 away by 9. That's it. W is less than 12. So our answer here is B. Let's see how we did across the state of Texas. So this was the 11th easiest. Uh, not much to do here besides just dividing both sides by 9. 56% of our students got it correct. We still got a decent amount of, I mean, 44 altogether, right? Didn't get it correct. But you notice there was 12s everywhere, right? 12s had to be there. So the question is, is which way is the, the equality symbol, the inequality symbol pointing? Well, we're not going to flip the inequality unless you uh, multiply or divide by a negative number. If you do that, that flips inequality. But that's something they really focus on in seventh grade, not so much in sixth grade. So we should have kept the inequality the same. You know, I, I guess I'll kind of understand if, if we got the 1 over 12. Um, but even then, if you set it up like dividing by 9, it's not going to make sense to suddenly flip that, right? So I think we might have had some students that made it a little bit overcomplicated. And so, um, you know, the the easiest thing to do would be to, you know, just, uh, just keep it simple. Look for the inverse operation, right? And just uh, divide both sides by 9. For number 18, we are ordering numbers. This is a readiness standard, TEK 6.2D, in reporting category 1. This is a drag and drop, but it's only worth one point. You either get them all correct or they're all incorrect. There's no part, full credit, partial credit, anything like that. So we need to put these in order from greatest to least. And like they do in sixth grade, they'll give it to us in just different formats. We've got decimals and we've got... Uh, mixed numbers, and we've got some fractions. We don't have any percents this time, but greatest to least, right? So let's just, let's make it very simple. Let's look at the ones place here, right? So I've got a two, I've got a one, right? So I'm going to say two point something, one point something, five point something, two point something, and that's, there's no whole number in Cedar Creek, so that's zero point something. Well, before I even do anything, I could already tell you that this is going to be my greatest built in because it's five point. It doesn't matter what that point two is. In this case, it's 5.2, right? But it doesn't matter because there's no other whole number greater than that. 
I can tell you that Cedar Creek is going to be my least because it's zero point something. So let's move Cedar Creek down here. Now, hopefully we re we remember our benchmark fractions, right? That's 75. So in order to compare those, let's put them all to the hundredths place, right? Uh, and then I can tell you what's the second least is going to be this Athens, right? Because it's a one point something. So I'm not even doing any calculations or conversions here yet. And hopefully I remember this is a benchmark fraction, right? So this is going to be 0.25. They give us the Arlington is 2.2. So all I need to figure out is what's going to be greater, right? Bonham or Arlington. But they give you the decimal in Arlington and Bonham, half, that's another benchmark fraction, right? So that should be 0.50. So as you can tell here, Bonham is going to be greater than, right, than this Arlington. 2.5 is greater than 2.2. So let's go ahead and put that Bonham in second place, that Arlington in the middle. And let's just go ahead and write our numbers just to make sure we've got it. So Belton is going to be, you know, 5.20. Bonham is 2.50. Arlington is 2.20. Athens is 1.25, Cedar Creek 0 0.75. We have our numbers in order from greatest to least. Let's see how we did across the state of Texas. So this was tied for the 14th easiest, even though it might not seem like much. The fact that we can get even half or a little bit over than half of our students getting this correct when you had to literally drag and drop all five into the correct spots. And if there were any incorrect, the whole thing got messed up. That's pretty good. So these five spots made a little bit more of a difficult problem, but 51% of our students got it correct. But the way I solved this by just looking at the ones place, we could have really eliminated a lot of our work. And the fact that, take a look, they gave us benchmark fractions here. They didn't give us anything strange like three eighths, even four fifths we should know, but you know, sometimes you have to do a little bit of work with four fifths, but they gave us halves and quarters. So we should know those things. So we just might need a little bit of practice here with the drag and drop and make sure that, you know, I'm sure some students still might have made the classic mistake of going least to greatest. But other than that, just extra practice with putting these in order, changing from, you know, whole numbers to decimals, um, you know, to improper fractions. We didn't have any improper fractions, so that's something they could have given us, right? Like five fourths. We need to practice with that. They could have given us percents, right? Like 75%. Uh, there's a few other variations. We just need to give students a little bit extra practice doing these things. For number 19, we are looking at representing integer operations. This is TEKS 6.3C in reporting category 2. So we just have this basic uh, operation here that we need to find as best represented by this model. So let's take a look at what we actually see happening here. So hopefully first thing we see here is that we've got jumps. Right, we should see that we've got four jumps. Okay, so that's going to be represented by either the four plus twos, or we've got the four arrows moving from, you know, from negative eight to negative six, or negative six to negative four, like they're moving two each. So that should help us. And so what we should look at then second is you know, we've got our four jumps of two. So we're going to Look at it kind of like that. Four jumps of two. And then where are we starting from and where are we ending up at? Okay, so if you look at the direction of the arrows, we're starting here at negative eight. Okay, and then what are we doing to these four jumps of two? Well, we're just, I guess we're just adding those four groups of, of jumps of two. And then where are we ending up at? Well, we're ending up at zero. So we went from negative eight all the way up to zero. Let's see if this would do it for us. Well, if I did negative eight plus four groups of two, four jumps of two would be eight. Yeah, negative eight plus, you know, positive eight, that would equal zero. All right, so I don't see this exactly, but I do see this and take a look. We can use the commutative property, right? The order property uh, that lets us know that you can take two factors when you're multiplying together. You could just multiply them in any order. Four times two, two times four. Same thing. So our answer here is going to be C. Let's see how we did across the state of Texas.
So this was the eighth easiest problem. No calculation needed, just needed to recognize 61%, so a little bit more than three out of every five students got this correct. We take a look at some of our incorrect answers, right? We see this, this negative two times four, and then we got the negative two times negative four. So students were really keying in on, you know, the four groups of two, and they realized they had to do that. Now, they're, it's not negative two. See, that should have been your first clue, right? Is they literally give you the plus two, plus two, plus two. But students here were just kind of queuing in on the two and the four. Um, obviously, not really taking into account the starting position, that negative eight, or where it ends up at as at zero. So this is one in which we just need practice. Uh, representing integer operations on a number line is kind of a strange concept. And so that's something we just need a lot of practice on with our students. For number 20, we are looking at debit and credit. This is TEKS 6.14b and reporting category 4. So we have debit and credit cards, just some basic statements, no calculation. We're just recognizing some of our personal financial literacy knowledge. We need to find the one that is not true. Okay, so interest is charged on debit card purchases. Well, this is instantly the correct answer. Uh, interest is not charged on debit card purchases. The reason why is this is pulling straight from your checking account. You are paying for any purchase with the debit card. Immediately pulls from your checking account. It's a credit card in which another company is paying for the purchase and then you pay that card back and you get interest charged to you if you don't pay it off by the end of the month. So interest is not charged your debit card purchases. See, this B is uh, absolutely true. Right, which means we don't want it because we're looking for the one that's not true. But debit card purchases, money's withdrawn directly from your bank account. So B is correct. C, the total amount of money that we spend on credit card purchases depends on a credit limit. Absolutely. They give you a limit for credit card purchases. And it depends on a variety of things. You know, your credit score plays a big part in that. Late payments and your history uh, with credit. So that's true, which means we don't want it. We're looking for the one that's not true. And when a credit card is used, money's borrowed. Absolutely you are not paying uh, for a purchase when you buy something with a credit card. The credit card company is paying for it. You're borrowing that money from them and paying them back. So A is our correct answer because it is not true. Let's see how we did across the state of Texas. So this was tied for the 18th easiest uh, or the you know 19th most difficult right there in the middle of a 36 question test. Not even half of our students could get this correct. I think a lot of this really has to do with the fact that personal financial literacy is definitely one of those sets of standards that a lot of teachers just either they don't get to or they really just kind of skim over. But there's always at least one, sometimes two questions on a test for it. And some of our students are one or two questions away from meets and masters. And so it's definitely worth our time. We just need to uh, talk about this and have a little bit of a, um, experience maybe writing about it. It's, there's not so much calculation about debit and credit as there is just discussing it and you know maybe even looking at some debit cards and credit cards, having kids explain the difference between the two. They just have, a, have to have a chance to really build their background knowledge about it because just memorizing random facts is very difficult. So we need to build a broad context about the difference between debit and credit in addition to just the few personal financial literacy standards that actually have us calculate interest or something like that. For number 21, we are multiplying by a fraction. This is Deeks 6.3b, and this is reporting category 2. So if we look at this type of question here, right, we've got what we call a match table grid. So we need to select uh, one correct answer for each row here. So we just need to determine whether the value of each expression is greater than or less than 25. So we might not necessarily see it immediately because uh, the first thing that really pops out is going to be each of our fractions, right? But we're multiplying each fraction by 25. So here's just the basic standard. When you multiply a number, any number, times a number that is, you know, greater than 1, okay? So let's say we've got anything that is greater than one. So even if it's like, you know, one and a half, okay? Uh, then that's gonna end up being a larger number. It's gonna end up being larger than X because you're taking more than one of that X. And if you multiply a number 
by something that is less than one, right? So let's say, you know, one half or three quarters, then that product is going to be less than the original number because you're not, you're not taking the full part of it. So all we need to do here is recognize, are these fractions greater than or less than or than one? Okay, then so 12 thirteenths. Well, 13 thirteenths is the whole. So 12 thirteenths is a proper fraction. So that's less than one. So since 12 thirteenths is less than one, multiplying 25 by 12 thirteenths, it's going to be less than 25 because my number gets smaller because I'm multiplying by something less than one. 15 seventeenths. Seven sevenths. 15 sevenths is definitely an improper fraction, right? Seven sevenths is the whole that is much larger than one. That's like two and one sevenths. So my number is getting bigger because if you multiply by a number greater than one, your product is greater than the original number. 98 twenty fifths, also an improper fraction, much greater than one. 25 twenty fifths would be the full. So we're going to get greater. And then even though 100 seems like a huge numerator, look at the denominator 100 over 181. That's still less than a whole because it would be 181 over 181. So I'm going to end up making a smaller number because I'm multiplying 25 by a number less than 1. That's all we need to do with this standard. It's just recognize that when you multiply by something less than 1, the number gets smaller. When you multiply by a fraction or a number greater than 1, it gets bigger. Let's see how we did across the state of Texas. So this was the eighth most difficult problem. We didn't even have... One third of our students get full credit, get the two points here. In order to do that, you had to get all four of these correct, right? If you wanted partial credit to get one point, you needed to get either three correct or two correct. If you only got one or zero correct, you know, you're not going to get any points at all. What made this difficult was probably some students didn't recognize that you actually didn't need to multiply. You might be able to multiply this one and this one, but really, you want to multiply this? because that's a little crazy. And then we definitely don't want to multiply that and then try to divide it by 181. So recognizing what this problem is, is it's just multiplying by a number greater than one or less than one. What does that do to the original number? That's all that is. And so students had to be able to recognize what type of problem this was and realize, oh, even though there is an expression, I don't actually have to multiply. So we just need practice with this. And the fact that you know, sometimes we'll probably see it as an individual problem like this and not necessarily see it at a, as a match table grid that might have thrown some of our students off. So we need some practice um, with looking at four or five different expressions all at once to see what's going to make our number larger or smaller. Because in this format, it should be a little bit more obvious that I don't really actually need to multiply. I just need to recognize what type of problem it is. For number 22, we are graphing on the coordinate plane. This is a readiness standard, TEKS 6.11a, in reporting category 3. So we've got four points are graphed. Uh, we've got M, R, X, and T. Point Z is not on there, but we need to put it on there. And we need to find which point best represents the location three and a half units away from point Z. All right, so let's zoom in here a little bit to make the graph a little bit bigger. I need to put Z here somewhere. So let's let's just figure out where Z is going to be. All right, so Z is at negative three and a half. Okay, so negative three and a half is like right there. And then positive three. So here we go. All right, so that's my Z. And that makes sense, right? If you draw a line connecting that that's right in the middle of those four. So you can't get rid of any of these answers because it's like a diagonal. So I need to just figure out how far away are each of these from point Z. Okay, so let's look for one that's three and a half units away. Let's just start with X, right? It goes from three to five and a half, right? The X stays the same, but the Y value changes. It goes from one to two and a half. Okay, so that's two and a half units away, not what I'm looking for. From Z, to m, right? The x value changes from negative three and a half to positive one. So that's going to be half, one and a half, two and a half, three and a half, four and a half. So that's too big. I need to find something right in the middle between two and a half and four and a half. Okay, let's look at 
r it goes from negative 3 to or positive 3 to negative 1 half. So I've got 1, 2, 3, and then at 3 and a half. So that looks good. I'm thinking it's r. Let's double check to make sure t is incorrect. I'm going from negative 3 and a half to negative 6 and a half. So I'm just going to count by halves. 1, 2, 3, since I'm staying on halves the whole time. So that's just 3. All right, so that's really what I'm looking for, right, is I'm looking for which point represents the location 3.5 units away. It went down to R, so my answer is B. Let's see how we did across the state of Texas. So this was tied for the 13th most difficult. Look, we only got 38% of our students getting it correct. And uh, especially these two right here, point M and point T, this makes me think that we might have some guessing going on here. So students did not necessarily recognize what type of problem this was. I think there was a few issues. Number one, point Z was not on there. So even just recognizing, look, I'm going to need to go ahead and just, you know, calculate and plot point Z. That was a step that might have eluded our kids. And even then, it is, you notice how I had to zoom in? If you don't zoom in, it's kind of difficult to keep track of how far away they are. So this might be one in which we need to work with our students to recognize, guys, let's use the zoom feature here. Let's zoom this in because if we don't, that's uh, the halves are very small. And so we probably need to work with our students just on the function of, you know, the zoom tool for this particular problem and even that drawing tool to make sure that they can, you know, draw and put that Z up there. Because if they're just trying to eyeball this without using that drawing tool, without zooming in, that's going to be very difficult. Uh, we don't probably necessarily want our students to try to draw their own coordinate grid on a piece of paper because there's so many room for errors. So we need to help our students practice zooming in when necessary, using this draw feature, and plotting that point Z, and then doing the calculation that way, rather than just trying to, you know, go from screen to scratch and just try to put it on your own paper or just eyeballing it. For number 23, we are determining the validity of equations and inequalities. And this is TEKS 6.10b in reporting category 2. So which equation is true when y equals 6 fifths? All right, so what we simply need to do, plug in 6 fifths to each of these, find the one that makes it true. Now, I do see that we've got a lot of fractions and improper fractions, so that's going to be kind of the challenge here. But we're just substituting. So let's just substitute in this y with 6 fifths. Okay, so 6 fifths plus 4 fifths equals 2. All right, well, let's double check. When we're adding fractions, we need the denominators to be the same. They already are. We only add the numerator, right? So that's going to end up being 10 fifths. Does 10 fifths equal 2? Yeah. 5 goes into 10 twice, no remainder. So that works. So I'm thinking A is our correct answer. Let's check, obviously, B, C, and D. So I've got this 1 and 1 sixths minus y. So I'm going to substitute in 6 fifths equals 0. Okay, so that means if it's going to equal 0, then 6 fifths needs to equal 1 and 1 sixth, right? Well, I can already tell you that's going to be wrong without even changing the denominators. Because look, this is 1 and 1 sixth. I'm going to go ahead and simplify this into an improper from an improper fraction to a mixed number. If I divide up, 5 goes into 6 one time, and I've got 1 left over. But look, my, num my numerator is 1, but my denominator stays the same as 5. So 1 and 1 sixth, 1 1 fifth, not the same thing. So they cannot equal 0. So I don't really care what they actually equal. It's just not going to equal 0. So B is incorrect. 0 0.2. Now this is tricky because that is a, a decimal, right? So 0 0.2 plus 6 fifths equals 8 fifths. Here's what we don't do. We don't add the 2 and the 6 and make that 8. That's not how it works. We now need to rewrite our 2 tenths, right? 2 tenths, but let's go ahead and simplify that. That's 1 fifth. So I've got 1 fifth plus 6 fifths. That equals 7 fifths, not 8 fifths. So that's a no. And then I've got 5 sixths times 6 fifths equals
equals 2. I'm just multiplying reciprocals, right? So 5 times 6 is 30. 6 times 5 is 30. That ends up being 30 over 30, right? You know when you multiply by the reciprocal, you end up getting 1. Ends up being 1, not 2. All right, so my answer here is A. Let's see how we did across the state of Texas. So this one is also tied for the 18th easiest to the 19th most difficult, depending on which way you look at it. A little bit less than half of our students getting it correct. And the incorrect answer choices were really just kind of uh, spread apart here, which means you either understood it or you really just kind of were guessing. So maybe our students are still struggling with what does it mean to substitute, right? Uh, I find it interesting that this is the most chosen incorrect answer because we would hope at this point our students would have known what happens when you multiply a fraction by its reciprocal, right? That should be a pretty obvious answer of it just equals one. But that just gives us an opportunity here to practice two different things. Number one, what does it mean to substitute, right? And taking a look at D, seeing as how that's our most chosen incorrect answer, maybe practicing with some reciprocals as well, because hopefully we want them to recognize that's going to equal one right, because we use that um, quite a bit of multiplying a fraction by its reciprocal. So that should have been one we easily eliminated. For number 24, we are looking at triangles. This is TIG 6.8a, reporting category 3. Now, this one talks about side lengths. When we typically talk about triangles, we're talking about the measure of the angles of a triangle. That's 180 degrees. But in this case, we're looking at how can we find the side lengths, use the side lengths to determine whether there's actually a triangle. Well, what we need to understand here is the triangle inequality theorem. So that says that the, uh, the sum of two different endpoints always needs to be greater than that third endpoint. So if we take any triangle, I'm just going to draw a triangle. I don't know if it's right, acute, obtuse, doesn't really matter. We need to take any two side lengths. A plus B needs to be greater than C, or A plus C needs to be greater than B, or B plus C needs to be greater than A. It doesn't really matter. Take two sides, add them together, it needs to be longer than that third side. So we see here we're already going to have a problem with A. 6 plus 8 is equal to 14, but it's not greater than 14. So that does not make a triangle. Let's take a look at B. 7 plus 11, definitely greater than 5. 7 plus 5, barely, but it is greater than 11, right? And then 5 plus 11, definitely greater than 7. So that's going to make a triangle. Take a look at C. I can tell you right now, look at that. 9 plus 9 does not make something greater than 20. It's quite a bit less. So you couldn't get the side lengths to connect. It needs to be greater. And then, you know, 10 plus 15, definitely greater than 4. But take a look at this. 10 plus 4 is not going to be greater than 15. That's your sticking point. So the only one that works that follows this triangle inequality theorem is B. Let's see how we did across the state of Texas. So this was tied for the 11th most difficult problem. We have, you know, a little bit more than a third of our students getting it correct. And we actually had almost as many students get that correct as we did for C. So what this lets me know then is probably students are not that familiar with the triangle inequality theorem. And as teachers, it's really easy because up to this point, every other star question that has ever been asked on 6.8a always asks about you know, what is the measure of this missing angle, right? If this is a 60 degree angle, and this is a 50-degree angle, all right? So we just need to add them up and subtract from 180, and you'll find your missing angle. That's what we do with triangles, typically. We might take a look at opposite sides and angles, if it's like an equilateral triangle or an isosceles triangle, but it always has to do with angles. But the standard, the 6.8a, also talks about using side lengths to determine whether or not something is a triangle. So we just need to add this as teachers, into our teaching, if we're not already doing it, how to determine whether three side lengths actually make a triangle. Number 25, we are looking at area and volume. This is TEKS 6.8D, a readiness standard in reporting category three. So this is a hot spot. We need to find three shapes that have the same or equal areas, 
right? So the only thing we really need to keep in mind is our area for triangle is one half base times height, and our rectangle is going to be base times height. So we do need to use two different formulas for area. So I'm just going to put area for triangle equals one half base times height. It's going to be that one and that one, and then let's do a different color here. Area for a rectangle equals base times height. All right, let's take care of the, the rectangles, since that should be easier, right? Just base times height. So let's do 5.1 times 2. Just double it. That's going to be 10.2. All right. We're just going to double the 7.4 as well. It's going to be 14.8. So those two are not the same. Let's take the 5.1, multiply it by 4. That's going to be 20.4. Okay, so none of the rectangles are the same. So that means these two triangles have to not only be the same, but they have to equal one of these rectangles. So let's do 6 times 3.4, but remember it's 1 half, right? So I could do, you know, this, the 3.4 times 6, or watch, and then take the half. I could go ahead and multiply that half by 6. If I did that, half of 6 is 3. So now I just want to do 3 times 3.4. That's a little bit easier. Let's do that. All right, so let's just do 3.4 times 3. So that's 12. 9, that's 10. There's my 10.2. All right, so those two look the same. So this should be 10.2 as well. Let's do that same thing. All right, so the area equals 1 half base times height. I want to go ahead and multiply that 1 half by 12. So that just turns into 6. So 1.7 times 6. Yep, there we go. 10.2. All right, so it's these three right here. Let's see how we did across the state of Texas. So we did not do too well on this one. This was our second hardest test. We only had 15% of our students get both points. Full credit is two points. Another 50% got one point, but even those two together, that's only 65% of our students getting one or two points. We had a full third not get any points. So what makes this one so difficult? Well, you did have to navigate two different formulas, right? We had the one-half base times height for the area of a triangle, and then we did have area of a rectangle, which is regular base times height. But other than that, we had a lot of decimal um, multiplication, but all of these just ended up having a whole number times, you know, a decimal to the tenths place. We didn't have to go to the hundredths place or anything like that. And it just required a lot of multiplication. You, you literally had to multiply, you know, all five, unless you happen to get these three correct answers first. And sometimes when it requires that much work, students will tend to get a little bit bored of it and just start to eyeball it and just take their best guess. So we need to give our students practice with uh, this exact type of problem, have them multiply different shapes with different formulas, find similar ones, and just build that stamina so they can stick with this problem all the way to the end. Number 26, we are looking at integer operations. This is Teeks 6.3D. I read in the standard in reporting category 2. So we've got Nathan throwing beanbags, and we just need to find the total number of points here. There is a none of these option, so we at least need to keep that in mind. All right, so there's a few different ways that we can solve this. All right, really what we've got here is we've got our 2 plus negative 4 plus negative 1 plus 1. All right, we're just going to add all four of these points. Some get us negative, some get us positive. Let me take a look at this right here, all right? We got a negative 1 and a positive 1. That's just going to cancel out that 0. So now we've got a 2 plus negative 4, or really that's 2 minus 4. Okay, so that looks like it's going to be negative 2, which is not there. So the answer could possibly be D, none of these, but that's kind of our last resort. So let's, let's look at it a different way. Let's look at it on a number line. So I'm going to start with a, a positive 2, right? So I'm going to get a plus 2, and I need to do a minus 4. Okay, so a minus 4 is going to go over here. Right, there's a minus 2 there, another minus 2. So now I'm ending it a minus 2, negative 2. 
and then I need to have another negative one, right? So that's another negative one. So I'm at negative three. And then I need to have a positive one. So I'm back up here, positive one. So I end up, yeah, I do end up at negative two. All right, so that answer is not there. The answer is D, none of these. Let's see how we did across the state of Texas. So this was the tied for the sixth easiest, so we did pretty well on this. Obviously, the, the none of these is a little bit um, concerning for some students because we've been taught most of them have, you know, don't choose that one. It's not going to be that one. But in this case, it really is. So hopefully they at least double check their work a second way, like I showed you. And, you know, the number one most chosen incorrect answer was this two. And that makes sense, right? Because if your answer is negative two, you figure, well, it can't be none of these. So maybe I just, you know, got the sign wrong. Uh, but our students did fairly well on this. What we probably want to do is give our students multiple ways to solve this, right? Whether it be that number sentence, right, that I originally showed you. That's one option. We could do the number line. Uh, we could also do some, you know, some algebra tiles, right? We can have, look at our positives, right? We've got one, two, three positives, right? And then we've got five negatives, one, two, three, four, five, and we just cross out a positive with a negative, right? And what are you left with? You're left with two negatives. What we need to do is provide our students with multiple ways to solve these integer operations with positive and negative. Number 27, we are representing numeric data. This is Geeks 6.12a reporting category four. We actually need to build a histogram. And so we've got uh, three different categories here. You see, we could just kind of click anywhere to kind of build those. So let's just get our data and let's make sure that we've got the correct uh, buckets or ranges, right? So we've got 151 to 200. I'm going to write that right here. So I've got 151 to 200. I've got 201 to 250 and then 251 to 300. All right, so let's take a look at our data set. These are our bowling scores here, All right? So 202 is gonna fit right there. 196 is gonna fit there. 280, all right, 176, got those four. I've got my 255, I've got my 190. My 200 is going to be right on that edge, but it's going to fit in that first bucket. Same with this 300 right on the edge, but it fits in that last bucket. And then I've got 207, and I've got 230, 240, and then 247. All right, so now I just need right, just some numbers. Well, I've got 1, 2, 3, 4. I got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And I got 1, 2, 3. That's all I need. Now I'm going to have to turn off my graph paper here. So I need to get four for my first one here. So let's get that there. I believe it was five for my second one and three for my third. But let's go ahead and double check. I've got my four, I've got my five, and I've got my three. There we go. That's how we get full credit. Let's see how we did across the state of Texas. So this was the 15th easiest, a little bit on the easy side here. 50% of our students got full credit. But we actually find it interesting here. A full third, a little bit more than a third, got no credit. Had just no idea how to build a histogram here. And the, you know, obviously there could be a little bit of issue of how to manipulate this, right? Because you'd have to click on it, and uh, that can be a little bit new for them. Uh, but honestly, histograms are new to sixth grade, right? This is the first time, first grade level they've ever really looked at it or been tested with it or even taught it. So there's a possibility that some students just might not have spent enough time with histograms. It is a supporting standard uh, in this case, though it does show up again, uh, you know, in 6.13a, which is a readiness standard. So hopefully we're spending time with histograms as educators, teaching them you know, how it's similar to bar graphs, how it's slightly different than bar graphs, and how we can build our own. And since most students don't have access to uh, an online testing platform that mimics what we do here on Star, we're just going to need to get out some graph paper and have them build their own 
histograms, draw them themselves with some data, and just get comfortable building them. For number 28, we are looking at multiplication and division. This is 6.3e, a readiness standard in reporting category 2. So we have a chemistry teacher here, 18 boxes, right? And each student will use two-thirds of a box, okay? So what we need to think of here is let's say I've got my boxes, right? So I'm going to draw some boxes here. Let's just say I've got an array. All right, so I've got my 6, I've got my 12, and then I've got, you know, there we go, 18. Okay, so each student uses two-thirds of a box of soda. All right, so let's cut that. Let's just do a few of these here. Let's do this first row. Because if we find a pattern, we can just find that pattern. We can kind of triple it, right? So if a first student uses two-thirds of a box of soda, right, that's that first student needs two-thirds. I still have a third left. So I'm going to alternate colors here. Uh, I can use a third from this box and then a third from this box. And then another student can use... That's two-thirds. Okay, so now I've got a nice set. So look what I have here. Out of these two boxes, I get one, two, three uses, or three students. Which means out of these two boxes, I can do the same thing. I get another three. Out of these two boxes, I can get another three. So I get three, I get th three, I get three. That's nine. So if I do that down here, I've got 18. And if I do that down here, I've got 27. So that's a visual representation. What did we actually do? Well, we took our 18, and we divided it into sets of two thirds. And hopefully we've been taught that when you want to divide by a fraction, it's the same thing as multiplying by its reciprocal. So if we multiply by its reciprocal, it's the same thing. We multiply by three over two, right? So 18 divided times three, Right, that's going to be 54 over 2, which equals 27. So that's how we can represent it with just an equation, or we could do it pictorially. But either way, our answer here is A. Let's see how we did across the state of Texas. So this was tied for the 11th hardest problem, and it should not be that much of a surprise that almost as much as our correct answer 27 was 12. How do we get 12? Well, if I don't see this as a, a division problem, I know I need to do something with my 18. I need, know I need to do something with my two-thirds. Now, the correct answer was to divide it, because that's what we did. We divided those 18 boxes into sets of two-thirds and counted how many sets of two-thirds we can get. What if you just set it up wrong? You went ahead and just multiplied 18 by two-thirds. Well, that's going to get you 36 divided by 3. And that gets you your 12. So we just need to help our students uh, visualize. That's why I started with that picture. Visualize that division problem because sometimes it's hard to get from just a word problem straight into this operation. Do I need to divide by two-thirds or do I need to multiply by two-thirds? Well, if we draw a picture, we can represent it that way. Then until we get fluent with it, then we can transfer that into the equation. So 29, we are looking at absolute value. This is TEKS 6.2b in reporting category 1. This is drag and drop. This is a two-point problem. Uh, so in order to get full credit here, we need to get all four of these correct. But we're just looking at the value, and hopefully we recognize them when we, when we use this notation here, right? This straight line, and then some type of digit or number, and then another straight line. Right, that's absolute value. That's the mathematical symbol that we use for absolute value. And that is simply asking, what is the distance from zero? All right, so what is the absolute value of five? Okay, well, if that's zero and that's five, how far away is five from zero? Obviously, it's five, right? So we're going to put a five right there. What about negative 25? Let's extend it. Let's pretend it's out here. There's negative 25. What's the absolute value of 
negative 25. How far away from zero is it? It's 25 away from zero. That's the thing with absolute value is it's just going to show the distance from zero. How far away is 25 from zero? It's also 25. How far away is this negative 5 from zero? It's going to be 5. What the absolute value does is it gives you answers that are going to be positive because you're just looking at the distance from zero. So we're going to end up using this 5 twice. We're going to end up using this 25 twice, and we're not going to use the negative 5 or the negative 25. So let's see how we did across the state of Texas. This was a little surprising to me. This was the seventh most difficult problem. Now, we're looking at that because full credit is two points. That means you needed to get all four of these correct. If you missed one or missed two, then you would get one point. And if you only got zero or one correct, right, you're going to get just zero points. So you put the full credit and partial credit together. Now we're looking at 93%. But... This is another new concept to sixth grade, absolute value, and it's a supporting standard. So it might be one that's a little bit glossed over, unfortunately, and that's just an easy point that we left on the table here. And I would probably assume, right, that if students didn't recognize this, what are we going to do? Well, we're just going to put a negative 25 there. We're going to put a negative 5 there, and that's going to get us that partial credit. So we need to take time to help students understand what this absolute value actually represents, because if they knew that, then they knew that they wouldn't use either of those two responses. For number 30, we are solving proportionalities. This is TEKS 6.5b, a readiness standard in reporting category 2. So we've got a 50-acre farm represented here, and this actually is visually represented with this fraction here. Right, we've got five rows and 10 columns so if we needed to right we can count the 29 acres here and we need to find what percentage of the of the 50 acre farm has crops growing on it so we need to turn this this or this which you know one represents the other into a percentage uh, what we could do is we could easily eliminate two answers here because we got to think okay so there's 50 acres so what's half of 50. Half of 50 is 25, right? So 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. So there we go. That's my halfway point. We should know that halfway, right, is going to be 50%. So I've got a little bit more than halfway, um, you know, filled in. So it's going to be a little bit more than 50. So look, I've already eliminated two answers. Now the 58 and 54 are pretty close. So I'm not going to just be able to eyeball that, but we can eliminate two answers immediately. So what does that mean? I've got 29 out of 50, right? That's my, my ratio or my fraction. Well, how do we turn that into a decimal? Because if I turn that into a decimal, I could turn that into a percent. percent. Well, when in doubt, you can always divide up. It's not going to be the quickest way in this particular manner, but you can always do it. So let me show you how you can divide up, right? 50 does not go into 29. So what we do here is we put a decimal. Bring down the zero. Okay, so how many times did 50 go into 295? That's my 250. 400. There we go. There's my 8. There's my 400. Okay, so we're good. So it goes in, you know, 0.58. Or we can look to say, look, if I double this, I'm going to be able to get my decimal or my fraction into a denominator of 100. And that's easily turned into a decimal because that hundredths place, right, lines up with place value, right? Zero point, that's my hundredths place right there. So I can say 0 0.58, 58 hundredths. So 58 hundredths, either way you look at it, and then you just move the decimal over twice to the right. What are we going to get? 58%. So that is my answer A, 58%. Let's see how we did across the state of Texas. So we had a fairly easy time with this. This was on the easier side, 14th easiest. But you see, we only got 51%, slightly more than half of our students get it correct. Take a look at this most chosen and correct answer, 29%. There's 29 acres. Yeah, that's not how percentages work. We need to provide our students opportunities to realize that just because you see a number 29, Unless it happened to be 29 out of 100, then you can say it's 29%, but that's not how percentages work. So some students are still struggling 
with how I turn a basic fraction into a percent, right? We need to first turn it into a decimal. And like I said, we can always divide up, but that could be a bit cumbersome. We can all also look to see, can we get our, you know, our denominator into 10, 100, or 1,000? Because if so, then we can use tenths, hundreds, or thousandths in our place value. Number 31, we are looking at the properties of operations. This is TX 6.70, a readiness standard in reporting category one. We just need to find an equivalent expression, but this is a property of operations that students will be using for the rest of their mathematical career, right? Whenever you see a number, now typically we're going to see it up front, but we can have it in the back. 7 times 3p plus 2, right? That's the same thing as what they did. They give you the 3p plus 2 and then the times 7 at the end. It doesn't really matter whether that times 7 is at the front or the back. Whenever we see this, we need to be thinking this is the distributive property. This is a very, very important property that students need to become familiar with starting in sixth grade and then just continuing on right so what does this mean this means when you're multiplying a number by an expression right this 3p plus 2 is an expression what you can do is you can take that 7 and you can multiply by each component within that expression and then just you know use that same operation that's on the inside so in this case add you can add them together so you can take this 7, right, and then multiply it by the 3p. And then you could take that 7 and multiply it by the 2. And since the 3p and the 2 are being added together, you can add those two together. So this turns into this, and that's just a very fundamental concept here. And we can actually now simplify. 7 times 3p means we're going to have 21 p's. You're leaving the p alone, but you can multiply the 7 and the 3. Then 7 times 2 right there's your 14 so that's what we have right there and if you want to just verify right make p turn into something right say p equals one let's just see what happens okay so if p equals one right then that's going to be three times one plus two times seven so three times one is just three three plus two is five times 7, so 35. So let's put a 1 in here and see which of these turns into 35, right? So if that's a 1, that's 3 times 1, so that's 3 plus 9, right? And that makes 12. That's 3 times 1, so that's just going to make it 3 plus 14 makes 17. 21 times 1 is going to make 21 plus 2, right? That's going to make 23. And that's going to be 21 times 1. That's 21 plus 14. That makes 35. So another trick is just to substitute in a really simple number, sometimes 0, sometimes 1, and just see what you get. So our answer here is D. And let's see how we did across the state of Texas. So this was tied for the 13th most difficult. And take a look. Our correct answer wasn't even the most chosen option. B was at 41%. And this is just showing us that some students might not know how the distributive property works. First off, what they did is they just multiplied the 2 and the 7, right? 2 times 7, that's where you get your 14. Not understanding that you need to, first off, multiply 7 by both terms, not just that second term. And so that really kind of raises the question, can you multiply a 7 by a 3p? Because I know 7 times 2, that's easy, that's 14. But what happens when you multiply a number like 7 times another number that has a variable with it? And so we need to give our students extra practice knowing that, yeah, you can still multiply the 7 and the 3. You just leave the P alone. That just turns into 21P. And we also need to just call out the distributive property. When we see it, I mean, that's just a, uh, that's a vocabulary term that students need to be able to recognize, explain, draw examples of, and use because they will be using it all the time for the rest of their mathematical careers. For number 32, we are looking at ratios and rates. This is TEKS 6.4b, a readiness standard in reporting category 2. We do have a drag and drop here. Not all answers will be used. We've got six options, only two blanks. So at the store, they go ahead and give us the ratio here. The ratio is going to be, uh, we've got limes to lemons. So 
let's get that limes to lemons. Okay, so it, they're telling us in the same order that it is on here. Sometimes they might switch it. They might say lemons to limes and then give us a table that's got limes to lemons. But limes to lemons is two to three. Okay, so let's label that up there. Let's label that right there. So that's our ratio. For every two limes, you're selling three lemons. And that's it. We're just completing the table. Okay. So let's use that as a ratio. All right. So let's uh, think about it like this. All right. So limes to lemons. All right. So we've got two to three. Two limes to three lemons. And then I've got 24 limes. And I'm looking for, you know, a blank number of lemons. Well, uh, I could use, you know, cross multiplication if I want to, or else I could also think, okay, two times what gets me to 24? Well, that's a basic fact. That's 12. So three times 12 is going to make 36. Okay, so that one's going to be like that. And we could do the same thing down here with our missing one. Limes to lemons is 2 to 3. And now I've got a blank numerator, and I've got 108. Okay, so 3 times what gets me 108? Let's see. Let's divide here. It's going to be 3. And that's going to be 6. All right, so 36. So then I just need to double 36. What do I get? 72. Those are my two answers, 36 and 72. Let's see how we did across the state of Texas. So this was the sixth most difficult. You see we only had 27% of our students get both points. And even if you had that one point that they got for partial credit for getting one of these two items correct, it's still just a little bit over half. And so this is an opportunity for our students um, to really practice what does it mean to use a ratio to find missing quantities. A lot of times we see these tables and we're looking for a basic multiplicative pattern, right? Like, you know, times two or, you know, plus 13 if we're looking for an additive pattern. But this table doesn't work this way because the ratio here is two to three. When we're using for basic multiplica multiplicative patterns, right, it's going to be one to something, like one to three. And so uh, students are just used to looking side to side. But with that 42 and 63, there's not really going to be much that you can do unless you're going to try to, you know, add something, right? That'd be a like a plus 21. But even if I wanted it, you know, plus 21, uh, that's not really going to help me with this one, right? That would be... Uh, if I did a plus 21, right, that's going to get me 45, which is an option. It's incorrect. If I did a plus 21, right, that's going to be 87, which is incorrect. But that's the wrong view here. And so we need to give our students opportunities to continue to set up these proportions uh, like we did here and use either cross multiplication or just basic knowledge of facts to figure out what these missing quantities are. Practice, practice, practice. For number 33, we are looking at fractions, decimals, and percents. This is TEKS 6.4G, a readiness standard in reporting category 1. So, we have a water park. It's offering a 5% discount. We simply need to find an equivalent value to 5%. And as easy as this might seem, some students are still going to struggle, especially because we see this 5%. And I see a 5, and I see a 5 right there. And neither of those are the correct answer. Let's see what 5% really means. All percents are out of 100, right? So what we could do is we could do this. We can say, right, 5%, because 100% is the whole thing, is equal to 5 over 100. I don't, I don't see that option there, but it's a fraction. So let's see if we can simplify, make an equivalent fraction. And, we, right, we could divide both by 5s. So that's going to be 1, that's going to be 20. So that's it right there. Or you can say, well, all percents can each be turned into a decimal, right? Since there's no decimal, it goes after the ones place. You can move it over twice to the left. Boom, boom. There is a blank spot. 
right? So you get 0 0.05, which turns into that, right? That's five in the hundredth spot. Now we need to simplify. You're still going to end up with 1 20th, but there's a few different ways that you can get there. So our answer here is going to be D. And let's see how we did across the state of Texas. So this was the 16th most difficult. Take a look. More students actually chose A than they chose the correct answer of D. Five, five. Look, we need to know that percents are out of 100. This is five tenths, right? 0 0.5 equals five tenths. This five percent, remember that equals five hundredths. Obviously, that decimal uh, makes a big difference if it only goes to the tenths place rather than the hundredths place, because five tenths and five hundredths are not the same thing. And we should know that 0 0.5 right, if we wanted to make it into a fraction, it's about half. Would we say that 5% is half? No, we know that 50% is half. So just a little bit of reasonableness, uh, even trying to explain our solution, probably help our students realize, wait a minute, 0 0.5 can't be, because I know that's half, but 5% isn't half, 50% is half. That could have at least given us a clue that that simple, obvious answer is not the correct one. For number 34, we are summarizing numeric data. This is TEKS 6.12c, a reporting category for readiness standard. So we have a list of numbers. We need to find the median, and they're not in order. So this is a classic problem we get in sixth grade, right? And what we need to do is we need to find what is that median or that middle number. So I always kind of draw a street like this. If we've got a street, it's got multiple lanes here, and then it's got multiple lanes right over here. Typically, you might find some trees or something in the middle, a little sidewalk, little something. They don't really like to have six lanes just go straight next to each other. This is called the median because it's in the middle. So we need to find the middle of this set of numbers but they're not in order. I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, right? So I'm going to need 6 and 6, right? But watch what happens if I just try to break it up like this. Well, I could find a 6 and 6, and, you know, I could try to figure out uh, what's in between 72 and 82, right? That'd be 77. That doesn't make any sense, and that's not even there. So let's not do it that way. Let's do it the correct way. Let's put them in order. So we need to put them in least to greatest. Greatest to least doesn't matter as long as they're in order. So I'm just going to cross off my lowest one there. It looks like I go 70 and then 72. Then I've got a 73. And then I've got two 75s. Now I'm going to keep track here because once I hit 6, right, that's going to kind of be my midpoint. 75, I think I'm done with the 70s. So now I'm to 80. All right. All right, so that's my sixth one. So what's going to come right after that? Well, that's going to be 81. And I could continue, but I don't really need to because this is my median right there. I've got two 82s, an 84, and an 86. Median is simply what's the middle? What's right in between 80 and 81? Well, if you look at it on a number line, right, when we get two integers, right, that half point is going to be a decimal. 80.5, we could break this up like this, or 80 and a half. Either way, our answer here is A, and let's see how we did across the state of Texas. So, we have about 52%, a little bit over half. This is our 12th easiest problem. Right, and what I'm interested in here is this B and D. What was so enticing about B and D? Well, if you figured out B, you did way too much work. It all comes down to what does this word median mean, right? Uh, it is a vocabulary word. There's nothing in the reference materials to help you out with that. You have to know what that means before you come out. But this right here is actually the mean or you know the average depending on what word you want to use here so literally what this person did 
if you get this, you add all of these up, which is, first off, way too much work, right? But you could do it. It's 942. Then you divide it by the number of, you know, numbers there are, right? There's 12 numbers all together, and you get your 78.5. So that's where that came from. Way too difficult. Uh, 16, you know, if you wanted to find the range, but most of us don't confuse the range with the, the median, right? But you're going to find your highest number and your lowest number, right? So that's 86 minus 70. There's your 16, but not many students did that. 82, well, that's going to be your mode, right? Your most chosen, your most popular. And what number pops up, right? You've got 82. You've got 82, and you've got 82. So that's the mode. So this comes down to just understanding vocabulary. What is the median, the mean, the range, and the mode? For number 35, we are solving one variable equations and inequalities. This is TEKS 6.10a, a rating the standard in reporting category 2. So we've got a uh, face of a clock here. We've got a circle with 12 equal sections, right? And if it, you know, if it helps us, we can label them as, right, we've got our 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then all the way around. But really what we're looking for is, what's the value of K? Okay, so what is that 1 12th, right? Each of these are going to be 1 12th, and that's going to be K. So the circle has 360 altogether, which we should know that already, but you know, they go ahead and give that to us. So what is the value of that 360? Well, there's a few different ways we can do it, right? One would be to say, well, how many Ks do I have? I've got 12 Ks. So 12 sections that are equally divided into K degrees, that's going to equal Right, 360. I can also set up a proportion, but let's just go ahead and do it this way. Well, if I've got 12 Ks that are going to equal 360, right? Uh, then how do I isolate this variable? This is a this is a practice that will start in sixth grade and continue the rest of our mathematical careers. Well, what is the operation that is holding that number 12 to the k. Well, that's 12 times k, so we think inverse operations. If I'm multiplying by 12, I want to do the opposite. I want to divide by 12. Because 12 divided by 12 uh, will cancel out. That's going to make 1, right? And 1k is just k. Right? We, we wouldn't write 1k. We would just write k. But you can't just divide one side by 12 without doing the same thing to the other side. That's the you know, the, the properties of equations there. You have to do the same thing to one side as you do to the other side. So now it's 360 divided by 12, right? And then that is going to be 30. So K equals 30, right? If we want, we could, we could double check, right? 12 times 30, yeah, that is going to make 360, so that works. So my answer here is K equals 30. C, let's see how we did across the state of Texas. So this was definitely on the easy side, and this was the seventh easiest. In fact, 63% of our students got this correct. Uh, not many people chose this B or D. What I find interesting is A. One out of every four students chose 12. Guys, how often is it that the answer to a question in math is going to literally be one of the numbers they give you in the problem? That should be our first kind of red flag right? That's the number of sections there are. They give you that in the problem. That's not the number of degrees in each section. So we need to give our students uh, opportunities really to, you know, not only, right, practice this right here. What does that mean to divide both sides by 12 to isolate that K, but also to interpret it from a problem situation, right? I could very well see this problem not giving you this number 12, and then 12 would definitely look very, very appealing. So we need to give our students opportunities to practice, uh, you know, deriving these equations from the problem situations. And also, um, how do you verify, right? How do you substitute in that your answer 30 to make sure that it works? Have our students practice double checking their work to make sure that it actually makes sense. Because if you try to put a 12 
inside that K, yeah, that equals 144. That doesn't equal 360. So if they would have done that, students would have figured out, oh, I got that wrong. For number 36, we are interpreting numeric data. This is TEKS 6.13a, a reporting category 4 readiness standard. And so we have a stem and leaf plot here, and we just need to evaluate all four statements. Only one of them is going to be correct. Uh, the stem and leaf plot has kind of just our standard uh, description here, down here in the key underneath. Right, we see that the 3 and then the line and then the 5 means 35. So this is acting as your 10's place. This is acting as your 1's place. Sometimes they'll do decimals. You know, sometimes we'll do kind of some different things. But it's just basic. Think of it as place value. The stems are the 10's, the leaves are the 1's. All right, so there are more riders between 10 and 13 than there were between 42 and 74. Okay, so 10 and 38. Or 10 and 38, not 10 and 13. So here's my 10 and 38, right? Because that's my 10, and then that's my 38. So count the number of leaves, and you'll get the number of riders. I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So they say 14 is greater than, because there's more than, 42. That's the rest of them, 42 and 74. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Yeah. That looks good to me. So let's verify B, C, and D are incorrect. There are more writers 14 years of age than there are writers of any other single. Okay, so they're asking for the mode. Right, so I've got a 14 right here, and I've got a 14 right here. But no, 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 take a look. I've got three 21s. So that's incorrect. The mode is not 14. Mode is 21. There were 31 riders in the roller coaster. Okay, and now I'm just, you know, adding, right? Uh, I well I already added. I've got 14 that were 38 and below. I've got 10 that were the 42 and above. So put that together, there's 24. I don't need to add those again. I already did that. And there were exactly three riders over the age of 50. Okay. Well, here are three riders over the age of 50. Right, you don't include 50. There's 52, 53, uh, 57, but that's just on that row. I also need to include these three as well. So actually there were six writers over the age of 50. There'd be three if I was only looking at the row. All right, so like we thought, B, C, and D are incorrect. Our answer here is A. Let's see how we did across the state of Texas. Well, this was a great problem to end the test on. This is our second easiest. 73% of our students got this correct probably helped that the correct answer was the very first one because they might not have wanted to read all four answer selections here to work them out. But this was a very good job of our students. Um, and some of the incorrect answers I thought were pretty tricky, especially this one. I thought more students would uh, get that one because it does, if you're just thinking about that row, that does work out there. So uh, we did a good job here. We can continue to practice this, but students seem like they did a good job with it.